<clears throat> Alrighty, welcome back. This video is literally recorded right after the last one, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the uh, incessant chirping of birds gently kindles the embers of my consciousness. My heavy eyelids open to find my body contorted before me. Legs, legs splayed across the couch in the most uncomfortable positions I can imagine. I groan and twist my torso, letting my spine pop and crack until the aches in my body drift away. I need to stop falling asleep on the couch. I'm still young, but I can't handle a night away from my comfortable bed. My eyes fall upon my open laptop, <clears throat> lying on its side on the floor. The screen is blank, the battery drained. I briefly panic, hoping against hope that I saved my work before falling asleep. I stumble to my feet and pick up a laptop, then charge toward the power outlet. I plug in and boot up, revitalizing the mechanical beast and feeling a wave of relief as the whirring of the internal fans signify the breath of life. The screen flickers and bathes my eyes in harsh light, my eyes squint against my will and I make out the image before me. The mutilated corpse of my latest victim, perfection in picture form. The timestamp in the lower corner reads May 27th, 11.07, tomorrow's date. The photo, is ready to, <clears throat> the photo is ready to be sent out. If I send it now, the victim will receive it immediately. Notice the date and realize that her death is imminent. It's time to set the wheels of demise in motion. Bet. Leaving my laptop at the outlet, I quickly dart into the kitchen. Well, to call it a kitchen is misleading. It's simply a tiled area connected to my living space. <laughs> that, that's an apartment for you. With a small refrigerator, microwave oven, and single hot plate. A small stack of drawers is nestled next to the fridge, and I pull open the second drawer from the top. Plunging my hand inside is always an odd sensation. My fingers get buried underneath a dozen cheap plastic flip phones. I grasp one of the phones between my thumb and forefinger and remove it from the drawer. It's a scratched up pink model from 2010 or so. A relic from a time not all that long ago, but that may as well be forgotten. I flip the screen up and turn the device on, relieved to see this artifact still holds power. To be fair, I charged up all of these phones just a few weeks ago, but the fact that they retain a charge after being inactive for so long is a testament to their engineering. In, in any shady line of work, these kinds of phones are referred to as burners, cheap, disposable devices that are discarded as soon as their purpose is filled. Damn, a monster hell is shot all over the screen and everything. I acquired them by rather unsavory means, but that's neither here nor there. Good old Java monster. I know most people don't really like these, but I fucking love them. I use these phones to send out the photos I make. By doing this, I avoid using my personal phone and thus prevent anything from being traced back to me. When a photo has been sent, I keep the burner phone for 24 hours. Okay. When a photo has been sent, I keep the burner phone for 24 hours, just in case the victim sends a reply. I know I'd get a good laugh out of that. Of course, I don't keep the phone on my person. I store it in an old shed out the back of my apartment building. When 24 hours have passed, I remove the phone's SIM card, stab it in half, and discard it with a combustible trash. The phone itself gets smashed and trashed in the dumpster outside a convenience store. I also delete the photos off my hard drive and clear my internet history. Obviously, I don't even use my own internet connection at home. I leech off my gullible neighbor's Wi-Fi. Rip. You know the neighbor that has their pat their uh, <laughs> Wi-Fi's name as like SWAT team or FBI or some shit. <laughs> they don't even have a password. He's under the impression I can't afford my own internet connection. Whether or not I convinced him of such is irrelevant. So he's happy to share his connection with me. Should the police ever try to track my actions, 
they'll only be led straight to my neighbor. Yikes. I've gone to great lengths to ensure my actions are untraceable. This has all been in anticipation of my inev inevitable success. Your boy can't read. Looking down at the pink phone in my hand, I clear my mind and focus on the task before me. The photo is transferred easily from the laptop to the burner phone. Once complete, I open the text messaging app and enter the victim's phone number. I leave the message filled blank, but I attach the photo, of course. The victim will receive an empty text message from an unknown number which only an image with only an image attached. Oops. The message is just about ready to send. There's one more flourish I'd like to add. I open a particular app I previously downloaded to every burner phone. It's simply called Number Mask, and it's one of the most ingenious apps I've ever used. The app asks for the number I want to use. I punch in my memorized trademark. Now when I send a text message, the receiver will see these numbers appear on the caller ID. Not only does it mask the burner's real phone number, but it's an extra calling card to help boost my infamy. I smirk, my thumb hovering over the send message button. <coughs> this is it. This is going to be my long-awaited victory. The second victim to end up dead. I just know it. This is the stepping stone of my success. The second of many bodies that will pave the way to my glory. I send the message. I arrive at work on time, just as usual. My handbag is heavy with the weight of several cans of coffee. Hopefully enough <coughs> to help me power throughout the day after having had such a late night. I can't help but yawn loudly as I wait for elevator in the lobby. Just before the elevator doors open, my phone starts to ring. I step aside and answer the call. Hey. Hello? Hi, Noriko. Good morning. Did I call at a bad time? Not at all. I'm just about to go into the office. Oh, should I call back later? It's no problem. Don't stress. Okay, um, sorry. The nervous, apologetic girl on the other end of the call is Aoi Sato, an old school friend from back in the day. <coughs> Though we never really had any common interests, we used to be inseparable at school. <coughs> she was shy, I was introverted. It was a combination that worked in our favor, even if our convers conversations were a little on the boring side. To say that we're no longer shy and introverted wouldn't be entirely true. Always gotten better, she's definitely more outgoing, but she still suffers from a great deal of social anxiety. As for me, I'm still pretty introverted. My tolerance for being around other people has improved a bit, but I do prefer solitude and visiting places I've never been to before. Visiting places I've never been to before puts me on edge. To call Aoi my best friend would be accurate. She's my closest confidant. Even so, she knows nothing about my part-time masquerading as corpse girl. No one does, and I plan to keep it that way. So, Aoi, what did you want to talk about? Uh, oh, well... You see, that guy at work is still bothering me, and I wanted to see if you had any more advice for me. Ah, jeez. The older guy that always hits on you? Yeah. What a creep. You're 19, for God's sake. He must be, what, 50? I, I think he's 52. Oh, damn. <laughs> you know his actual age? Um. Um. Well, whatever. If he's still bothering you, you have to take a stand. He's not your co-worker, right? Just a regular customer? That's right. Then tell your manager. Have him banned from the venue. I... I can't talk to the manager. I don't want to cause trouble for the company. Jeez, girl. Sometimes you need to stand on your own two feet. I know. Well, if talking to the manager is out of the question, then you need to be firm with the creep. Tell him you won't stand for being groped anymore. His behavior is simply unacceptable. And if he won't change, you won't serve him anymore. He's... He's scary, Noriko. I don't know if I can confront him like that. He's always drunk. Even before he comes into the place. I try not to serve him too much, but... <sighs> 
Are you sure you can't quit that stupid job? Working at a maid cafe really doesn't suit you at all. I thought you wanted a government position. I do. I want to work in a cozy office, kind of like you, but you know I don't have any qualifications. Why don't I see if there's anything open here? Maybe Shinya can help out. He got me this job, remember? Shinya... Hmm, maybe. He was always a nice guy, right? <laughs> He's super nice. A uh, stick in the mud, but a nice one. <laughs> Noriko, don't be mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want me to ask? Yes, please. If it's no trouble. It's no trouble. I'll talk to Shinya. Then maybe you can quit that crappy job and come work with me. Oh, that really does sound wonderful. Thank you, Noriko. I'd be <clears throat> so lost without you. I like how that explosion kind of peaked on the mic a little bit. That was kind of funny. <laughs> there was an explosion that the military did just now. I'm just fucking... <laughs> see the mic peak and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Don't be silly. You're amazing, Aoi. Leave this to me. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And the call on Hiva Sai, having to go and ask Shinya about a job actually is a pain in the ass. But I never admit that to Aoi. I want to help the poor girl. I really do. I'd do nearly anything for her. The elevator arrives at the lobby and I step inside as soon as the doors open. And that's where this episode is going to stay. Good morning, Kurosawa. Good morning, Shinya. Deuces. <laughs>